here for for our today's talk. Uh, we are, as usual, going to give a minute or two to people to uh, come in as they are doing so, as I see past. But still, uh, it's a, it's my great pleasure to be here with uh, such honorable panelists and uh, distinguished professors and uh, very promising young researchers. Uh, I'll say a few more words about them. Uh, but before we continue, I needed to say because that, that's the thing I usually forget to be and immerse and enjoy uh, enjoy my, my guests. All right. So uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, we have quite an interesting topic for uh, today's afternoon, in my case, morning in uh, for, uh, Professor Laurel's case and uh, an evening in Andrew's case. Uh, but the topic is uh, music and the brain. And uh, why should we at all uh, be interested in uh, neural correlates of musical interactions? We're going to hear some very interesting stuff today and hopefully have, have a fruitful discussion. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me introduce some general uh, rules. Uh, here it says duration 90 minutes. It's actually, uh, um, it's actually more than planned, but we'll see if, uh, if, uh, if we can push that. Uh, questions, uh, do feel free to uh, send your questions in the questions tab. Uh, I promise we will read them all. I cannot promise we will answer them all due to the time restrictions. Uh, we will uh, have some introductory slides and then we will, uh, we will open up uh, a discussion and, uh, and see where, where does this get us. So uh, this video will, will be recorded. We will put it on uh, uh, MBT YouTube channel. Uh, parts of the videos might be cut uh, with uh, some interesting questions and answers, and uh, you will all be informed about that. Uh, about the content, uh, I'll give a short introduction, then we'll hear uh, an overview of this topic, and then we will uh, get to, to the discussion according to, the, to this, this schedule. So now if you, if you put together this, uh, this, the, this content schedule, you'll actually see that it's 65 minutes and not 90, so we do have some, uh, some room there. Uh, a bit of an introduction. Uh, first, uh, great panelists that we have. Uh, it's always hard to introduce Professor Stefan Devener because uh, there are so many topics that he covered in, uh, in his career. I will start by my personal experience. Uh, he's, he's a true pioneer in, in mobile EEG. Uh, from the moment where mobile EEG was uh, actually starting to be investigated as a research tool, where you kind of get to back down from some uh, variables, uh, wearable devices and see uh, if and how can they be utilized in, in a research uh, context and uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the precision and the quality needed by, by research. Uh, Lately, he has been involved in some very strange uh, and, um, and uh, I would say tropical uh, ways to record EEG around the years with uh, printed electrodes known, uh, known as uh, C-grids. It's a very much open area uh, and you can look it up, I encourage you to. Uh, Professor uh, Laurel Trainer uh, is someone I, uh, I just have an opportunity to meet and this is a, uh, this is a great pleasure. Uh, she is a director of the Institute on uh, Music and the Mind at uh, McMaster's and uh, a person who has, uh, a, similar to Professor Devener, done many, many things in life. Uh, for me, the most interesting thing is how the music and the, and the perception of sound is, uh, is uh, perceived by, by babies and infants and uh, how does someone who doesn't understand uh, yet word, uh, words can... Uh, enjoy sound, what is the role of it, and uh, how does it help the, the overall develop, uh, development. Uh, 
Uh, Anna Zam is, uh, as I said, a young researcher and, uh, and a colleague that I know for, for a few years, uh, involved in very challenging task of recording uh, uh, several EEGs in the musical settings. Uh, we know that this was a uh, rocky road uh, with uh, many imperfections along the way, uh, but uh, I'm very happy to see that, uh, that some nice and fruitful research went out of it. And um, uh, Dr. Andrew Yang, uh, Andrew Chang, sorry, is someone I again uh, had the uh, only now opportunity to meet, and uh, uh, a very promising researcher who is involved in music research and interbrain uh, correlations uh, driven by it. Uh, you, saw, you can also check some of his work, and I, I encourage you to. Uh, I won't spend uh, many words on, on myself. I'm going to be the host of, uh, of this show and uh, I'm uh, heading the MBT. Uh, uh, what we do is uh, we're specialized in making fully mobile EEG research devices. And uh, we have this, uh, this approach that uh, looks above, above the horizon. We work with the pioneers, people who see the opportunity first and, uh, and the problems later. And uh, our stance is that the equipment should not be on the way uh, of preventing some things. So you should not have problems with the equipment. The equipment should work for you and it should be as usable as your mobile phone um, so that you can set up experiments and do what you know best. And that is, uh, and that is research. Uh, some of the things we, we do is on this mobile, uh, mobile EEG line is, uh, is shown in this picture. So we have, uh, as my, our most popular product, the smarting device that is worn behind the head. But recently we also have uh, smartphones that I will uh, say a few words about. This is a very novel device in the, in the research settings, uh, namely, uh, the the uh, innovation comes from the fact that you conceal the EEG by the fact that uh, electrodes are, are um, behind the headphones similar as mine and that is, it is something too easy to mount. You don't have to wash hair, of course, with a limited number of, uh, of electrodes recording positions and something that is very acute in these days, it's uh, self-applicable so that uh, the, the, the amount of risk is minimized. Uh, and the use cases that, uh, that we see are uh, related to auditory, uh, auditory studies, uh, music research, uh, hyperscanning in music, classroom studies, and, and more. So uh, before we go to, to this uh, overview, I would like to take the, the chance and ask all of, all of our uh, panelists, uh, what do they think? What is the evolutionary role of music in our lives? Is it a side effect or is it something meaningful, meaningful that, that drives uh, and lives with us? Dr. Trainer, maybe you can uh, start with you. Okay, well, that's a big question. Um, I, think, I think the answer is actually somewhat complicated. First of all, music is extremely important in our lives. I mean, it's found in every culture. Um, Parents and caregivers sing to infants around the world, and that helps them to regulate their state and get into a state in which they can learn. So music is serving a lot of functions um, for us, and it's uh, universal across human societies. Whether, I think your question was about evolution, whether music is an evolutionary adaptation is a complex question. I think a lot of the building blocks of music uh, actually evolved for other reasons. Uh, so auditory scene analysis, identifying um, uh, sound making objects in the world uh, that many mammals uh, can do. But I think there were some aspects of music that probably were evolutionary adaptations, uh, like the connection to social affiliation, um, emotional responding and so on. So I think evolution is a very complex interplay between culture and gene. Uh, and, and some of that, I think, uh, some of music, I think definitely um, is a good candidate to be an evolutionary adaptation. Okay, thank you very much. We have, a, we have a joke from Andy Dijkstra. 
like that this is a very small question to start with a smiley. So, yes. Um, so, Professor Devener, what do you think? Well, uh, um, luckily this morning I had a check, chat with Anna and she reminded me of a paper that's about to come out in behavioral and brain sciences and they argue that basically music supports social bonding, which I find quite, quite interesting. So I'm going to read it. I'm probably the only one here not educated in music. I'm not a musician. I only enjoy listening to music and yeah, there's certainly a strong social aspect to it. Okay, so uh, you read it by and by the end of the panel, we'll ask you again. <laughs> yes, kind of. Okay, Anna, what do you think? Uh, so yeah, I agree with what Laurel just said, and yeah, th this this question is relevant to a special issue of brain behavioral science that just came out. Actually, I don't know if you were aware of this, but um, where they and actually th th there were two theories proposed in this. Um, special issue. One was that music is a um, evolutionary adaptation to facilitate social bonding and the other article said that music is um, uh, an evolutionary adaptation to uh, for credible signaling quote unquote to, to communicate information as a conduit to communicate, communicate um, information effectively um, and I guess I won't take a full stance on that both have their um, merits but I think today's topic is group coordination uh, so perhaps I will for today, say that music plays an evolutionary role in social cohesion, but yeah. Okay, last but not least, Andrew, do you have something to add? Uh, not much, but I would say that um, according to what I have read so far, music seems to have a deep association with interpersonal interaction, coordination. So I'm happy that we can discuss this aspect of music today. Probably we can have some insight of evolutionary function of music. Excellent. I won't take much more of your time. Let's uh, let's start with your overview before we continue the discussion. All right. Um, thank you very thank you everyone and thank you Ivan for inviting us and thank you Anna for organizing this. Um, I'm Andrew Chan. Uh, I was from McMaster University, so I'm going to talk about what I learned and what I have worked with Laurel and Anna was share with her uh, research. Um, all right. Let's begin. So um, according to the study published last year um, in, in science, they found out that the music appears in every society observed. And if you look at the, into the functions of the music, uh, music seems to be mostly used across all the society used in dancing, healing, and caregiving, um, suggesting, and all this behavior are apparently interpersonal interactions. And another study also showed that uh, cross-culturally, group performance is one of the universal feature of music. So suggesting that music, not just a common human uh, activity, but group in and also group interaction is a universal feature of music. And today we would like to argue that music can be an excellent model for understanding group coordination of simultaneous actions. Um, I know many of the audience are interested in, in interpersonal coordination or maybe have conducted some studies on this aspect. And many studies and many aspects of the interpersonal activities, uh, such as having conversations or in a classroom context, I will categorize those activities as non-simultaneous turn-taking behaviors. But music is a little bit different. When, um, in, in many cases, we play uh, music together at the same time, but at the same time, we need to adapt with each other. This is very similar to many other human group behaviors, such as dance together. This is apparently related to music, but it can be also as simple as moving a heavy object together, such as moving a desk, or it can be as complicated as playing a team sports. So those uh, human group activities require simultaneous actions and online mutual adaptations, which is, I would say, a little bit special and a little bit challenging to, um, to understand. So why, among those kind of activities, why I would argue that music is an excellent model, because music actually provides a great platform to balance between experimental control and ecological interaction. It can be a very wide spectrum. 
So uh, taking experimental control, for example, we can have a very well designed, uh, we have, have a pre-recorded um, metronome sequence in the computer and we play that sequence to a participant and the participant have to play the piano, follow that sequence. So that is a very well controlled case. But at the other side of the spectrum, we can have a live performance with a bunch of audience and the musicians can improvise, blah, 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 blah. But in between, we can actually balance between experimental control and ecological interactions. For example, we can have an adaptive, uh, we can uh, program the computer to adapt its tempo sequence along with the partner's performance speed. So the computer can slow down or speed up, adjust to the, 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 the participant. Or we can have a two individual playing together, or it can be as complicated as like four member, uh, four musicians playing together. So I would, uh, so in sum, I would say that music perform really, uh, music provide a really good platform to we can uh, balance um, experimental control and ecological interactions. Um, you might wonder that uh, playing music together, isn't that just simple? So everyone just follow the beat track and we just play the notes already written on the script, uh, on the sheet. Isn't that just easy? Uh, I can tell you, no, it's way complicated than that. Um, so I'm showing the figure of one study documented two professional pianists, uh, their performance. So if you look at, uh, the, if you look at the middle thick uh, black line, that represented the, um, the ideal noted duration on the score. So if you perfectly follow the score, you should uh, play exactly on the horizontal bar. And the y-axis represents the deviations from the noted duration. And you can see that those two individual pianists, they not only have quite a lot of deviation from the noted duration, but they also show quite uh, inconsistent patterns. So suggesting first, they are not um, robot playing exactly following the scores, but also they have different ways to play the music, speeding up or slowing down, depending on the aesthetics feelings or needs or, or, or planning. Um, and they have different ideas. So imagine if we put multiple musicians together, for example, four musicians together, how much of the mutual adaptations, compromising and communication they need to make in order just to play the music at the same time. This is very challenging and very complicated. And you might wonder, oh, even though music is a good model understanding these, but um, is understanding music um, can, can inform us about something bigger than music itself. So in this study that's uh, done by Laura Cirelli, Kate Anderson, and Laura Trainer a couple of years ago, they showed that the synchronized actions can promote prosocial behavior even as young as to 14 months infant. So I'm showing a little bit uh, video abstract of this study. It's very cute. The experimenter stands across from the infant and music plays over the loudspeakers. The assistant bounces the infant to the beat of the song and the experimenter facing the infant also bounces, either in synchrony with how the baby is bounced or out of synchrony, for example at a faster or slower tempo. Subsequently, we measured the infant's helpfulness towards the experimenter. To do this, the experimenter would try to complete a goal, like drawing pictures with markers, putting balls in a bucket, or pinning dishcloths up on a clothesline. In each trial, the experimenter would accidentally drop the object she needed to complete the task, and the infant was given 30 seconds to respond. We found that infants who had been bounced in synchrony with the experimenter were significantly more likely to assist with the dropped items and to help early in the trials, compared to infants who had been bounced out of synchrony with that person's movements. All right, so this study also demonstrated that music, uh, one aspect of music evolution of values that if we dance along 
of the music probably that promotes a group cohesion and uh, that's why we can survive. So, so the point I want to make is that study music activities, the music group behaviors can have a lot of implications on human evolution and human cognitive function way beyond music itself. All right, sorry. All right, so uh, I would say not just, so we can say that start understanding group, music group behavior, uh, we can have insights, generalizable insights into modeling simultaneous group behaviors and leader follower coordinations, bidirectional auditory motor coordinations, because they have to communicate, they have to play the sound together. And we can have, under, we can understand the social consequences of group behavior and even more abstract on the creativity and flow, et cetera, et cetera. So Anna, your turn. And I think you're, I think you're muted. So you should right. one, okay. one big question. Um, sorry about that. Uh, one big question is what are the neural correlates that support uh, interpersonal synchrony between performing musicians? Um, and so we know that uh, musicians, when they play together, they, their asynchronies, at least when they're professional, tend to range between, you know, zero and a hundred milliseconds. So they are very good at synchronizing. So we need a neural metric that will be able to capture this time scale of performance. And so EEG is very well suited to that. Obviously, uh, it has the appropriate tempo resolution. And as a result, in recent years, there have been um, a number of EEG studies on interpersonal synchrony between performing musicians. Not a large number, it's a new, it's a relatively growing field, um, but there have been some. And so today we're going to present to you the work that we have done um, on the neural correlates of interpersonal synchrony between performing musicians with EEG. Uh, these are two snapshot studies uh, in a growing field, but we think they are representative samples, hopefully, that will uh, spur a discussion of open questions uh, that we will have after the talk. So uh, first, I'll present uh, the work that I did with Stefan and uh, my uh, McGill supervisor, Carolyn Palmer, and colleagues. Um, and in this work, we were primarily interested in whether uh, musical partners uh, show similar EEG dynamics when playing duets together. And so to address this question, we had pianists uh, come into the lab and play duets with one another while they while wirelessly measured EEG wirelessly in a scenario that looked something like this. Okay, so I won't bore you with for Ajaka continuously, uh, but participants basically just played this piece re repetitively um, at a rate that was comfortable for them. And we recorded EEG and then we assessed whether partners um, who were playing together showed correlated patterns of EEG activity, specifically at the frequency of the musical beat or pulse, which is the, the rate at which you, the at which you would generally tap along with a piece of performed music. And so we correlated the amplitude envelope of cortical oscillations at the uh, frequency of each pair's unique musical pulse. And um, you can see in the black bars, we did th those correlations. And we compared those the strength of those correlations with correlations of uh, envelopes between pianists who were not playing together. So for each pianist with all other pianists in the sample, except for their true partner. And we called those surrogate pairs and those are shown in the white bars. And you can see that um, overall pairs who were playing together showed a higher correlation of EEG activity at the frequency of the musical beat or pulse relative to pairs who were not actually playing together. 
suggesting that when you play music with a partner, you do show correlated uh, brain activity at the frequency of the performance. But a big question is, does this correlated activity arise from the musical structure? So to address this question, we actually assessed the dynamics, uh, amplitude dynamics of musical rhythm and compared them with the dynamics of the EEG signal. Uh, so to do this, we uh, created an impulse response uh, at the frequency of the EEG signal, the uh, sampling rate of the EEG signal. And then we filtered this response at the mean beat or pulse frequency of each pair to create an oscillation. And then we took the amplitude envelope of that oscillation to get an assess the amplitude dynamics of the actual tone onsets produced during performance. And then we compared these envelopes of the tone onsets with the amplitude envelopes of the EEG activity, also at the frequency. And what you can see here it, for a sample pair is that there's a quite strong correspondence between the amplitude envelopes of the EEG signal at the tone onset frequency and the envelopes of the um, the tone onset the tone onsets, and what's most notable is that the amplitude of both drops at time points in the melody indicated by the arrows here, uh, where the um, tone where the musical where tones deviate from the pulse frequency. So when the tones are either slower than the pulse frequency or faster than the pulse frequency. So again, this suggests that um, the, 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 the EEG signal is indeed tracking the um, rhythmic structure of the music performance. So in some implications of this study are that when partners produce rhythmic actions together in music performance, their neural oscillations couple at the pulse frequency. Um, but this coupling cannot be solely explained by the noted musical structure because it is higher between pairs who performed at the same time relative to pairs who performed at different times. However, since the amplitude, e.g. amplitude dynamics do seem to reflect the musical rhythm, this interbrain coupling, this increase in interbrain coupling between pairs performing together may arise from pair specific timing characteristics of their unique performance. So this is an open question. Um, but in some, we, this study suggests that playing music with a partner does lead to interbrain coupling at the frequency of the performance. So that concludes our study. And now Andrew, I guess, will present his similar work. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Okay. All right. So thank you, Anna. So Anna demonstrated that um, she designed a very well controlled experiment uh, to address um, uh, the, the, the research question she's interested in. And but on, the, on, the, on the other side of the spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, that we can have a very uh, natural, very ecologically valid uh, interactive situations such as Live Lab. Um, we argue that we say that Live Lab is really unique at McMaster University because. We build a small concert hall space, and uh, but in this space we can have like hundred audience seats and uh, and uh, multiple uh, and multiple musicians perform on the stage. But the unique part is that we can record the EEG philosophical active is electrophysiological activities and um, and their motions at the same time. So we can measure multi persons neuroscience together in this uh, artificial lab environment. And this is what we have done that in one of my studies uh, I, I'm working, currently working on is that we uh, invite a professional string quartet come to lab and then we record their brain waves while they perform a, uh, the string quartet piece together. So in this study, um, in this study, I random, we randomly assigned one of the performer as the leader and the rest to be the follower regardless of their musical roles. So for example, even though you play viola or second violin, which uh, if you know that the typically is not that important as a first violinist in many uh, string quartet pieces, but if we assign you as a leader, you have to act as a leader. And the rest of the musicians have to also stick with their follower roles. And uh, at the different trials, we assign different musicians as a leader or followers. And so by doing these manipulations that we can, we want to observe how the later follower dynamics is being reflected in their brain waves. So we found out, oh, so by the way, uh, so um, I don't want to make a very strong conclusion because we're still analyzing the data 
and uh, there are lots of puzzles we need to figure out, but I just want to demonstrate it how we, we did the research. So uh, using EEG, and then we, first of all, because there are so many channels, we want to narrow it down to a few brain regions we're interested in, for example, visual cortex, auditory cortex, somatal, uh, um, uh, sorry, supplementary motor area in, related to motor planning and lateral prefrontal cortex related to executive function, et cetera. And then we can use some mathematical tools such as grand causality or partial diagrammatic coherence to understand how the brain waves from one region of one individuals predicting the brain waves activity of another individual. So this is what we have done. Uh, again, I just want to demonstrate it. This is the way we do it. I don't want to make a strong conclusion on the finding, but as you can see that we can quantify, for example, taking the middle um, figure, for example, we quantify the follower to leader and you can see that from the followers SMA, you have a certain degree of the coupling, directional coupling uh, to the leader's auditory cortex. But look at the left side figure, you can say from the leader SMA to the followers auditory cortex, the coupling strength was different. So we think, we think this asymmetric coupling strength might be associated with their leader follower roles. Of course, more statistics and more investigation are needed, but um, these approaches uh, give us a way to understand the leader follower relationship. But, and also by doing this kind of uh, uh, Granger causality or partial directed coherence investigation, uh, like Anna mentioned earlier, that uh, if people playing the music together, uh, they hear the same sound. So their brain waves would be largely similar because they're driven by the same sound. But if we want to understand the interactions using these kind of techniques, this, this mathematical model, we are understanding the relationship between one brain predicting another brain. So we're not, we're observing the effect, which is, I, we think it's above and beyond the similarities between the two brains. So uh, we'll keep doing this kind of investigation. But uh, again, um, doing this kind of research, although this is very natural, uh, but it also brings a lot of limitations and challenges. For example, in this highly non-controlled environment, of course, you have a lot of motor artifacts. And for example, in this uh, photograph, if you look at the EG waveform, you, uh, you can easily observe like two very uh, huge artificial uh, motor artifacts on the screen. And uh, how to deal with this artifact is really challenging. And at the same time, you have a very small number of trials because asking them to play a music piece typically take like two, two to three minutes at least. Um, and that's just one trial compared to the traditional um, experiment psychology, one trial may take like only five seconds. So within an hour, you can only have a very limited number of trials that only also related to the challenge of how to deal with the artifacts because you cannot just simply reject one trial because you only have very few traps. So we have to deal with the traps. And some people might be asking, uh, if we recruit the musician, professional musicians, and we understand their brains, would that be a biosample? Um, whether their findings can be really generalized to the um, non-musician population or entire human being, um, does that valid? That we can discuss that later. And theoretical part, I mean, we can measure so many brain activities at the same time, but when they play the music together, they, there are multiple cognitive functions are being engaged. For example, leader to follower communication, leader monitoring the follower's actions and motor planning and attention control, et cetera, et cetera, so many different functions. So how should we, how could we tease apart from one brain activity and map one brain activity to one specific brain function, cognitive function. That is very challenging given the limited number of trials and uh, also the uniqueness of each trial. So, um, yeah, so hearing, motor planning, attention, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so although we found this is very, so, so again, although we think this is very cool to do this kind of research, but also there's lots of challenges uh, we need to fix. So uh, I think it's time for open discussion, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, first, 
thanks for this lovely overview and uh, I'm sure that the questions come naturally there. Uh, so I have to say uh, for you, Andrew, there are some controversial questions. Well, let's start from the audience. Uh, Murali M uh, asks, uh, Dr. Chang, the music bound video was cute, but perhaps when the baby is synced out of phase with the experimenter in front, the baby gets lesser chance to focus on the eyes of the experimenter, which is known to be important. Does this study address this potential compound? Uh, may I leave that to Laurel to answer this question? Because I'm not the author of it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sure. That's, um, I mean, that's a really great question. And we also thought that might be the case that um, if someone is moving the same way as you are, th that you actually would focus more visual attention on them. Uh, it turns out it's not the case. So we, we, we didn't do a highly controlled study on this, but we did uh, measure the amount of time that infants were looking at the face of the person across from them they were bouncing with. And there was no difference in conditions where they were moving in sync and moving out of sync. So that actually surprised us a little bit, but it seems that um, just pure amount of looking um, is not the major factor that, that's going on here. I think you're muted. I'm oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. I said thank you for that. Uh, maybe uh, coming back to another uh, uh, other another topic that Andrew mentioned, uh, it is it has been reported that actually from EEG you have uh, quite a limited number of uh, PCA components that uh, can be attributed to brain activity, uh, which makes uh, the coupling of uh, music related versus non music related uh, stuff uh, difficult. Uh, is there an answer or at least uh, some way to, to address it. Yes, that's a really good question that also uh, um, that that's why this study will keep investigating for many years analyzing data. So uh, first of all, I would say that we need uh, experimental manipulations. So if there are some other artifacts and but if in the experiment we have condition A versus condition B so the motor artifacts or other noises should have, I mean, relatively equal contribution to the two conditions, then the differences should reflect the experimental man manipulated related factors. So that's why we still need experimental manipulation. We couldn't just observe uh, one per performance. We really need manipulations. The second thing is that, yes, it is really ch challenging to take out the noises. So according to what I, what I found so far, um, the EEG lab provided uh, one algorithm called the artificial subs um, subspace reconstruction, uh, ASR. I think that is a very cool algorithm because it can reconstruct it, the online EEG recordings and uh, re just take out the remoting, uh, the artifact part as a latent variable and then, and then give a quite clean um, EEG signal. So that is, and it doesn't require many trials. It just require one long recording. So I think this is so far the most uh, feasible approaches to like my kind of EEG recording. I'll remember what you said. Uh, I, I think I know a person on this panel that I want to address this question to specifically. But what I want to do is uh, ask another question on the same uh, topic. So, uh, uh, do you believe that uh, these correlations, uh, whatever the the, uh, the parameters used to to describe it, uh, either phase or uh, or others, uh, do they change uh, with the amount of immersion in music? So can we can we expect that uh, uh, more of the music immersion will lead to higher correlations along the way? Is is there something known about it or? The question is for everyone, actually. Everyone is muted except me. So. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll dive in a little bit. It's such an important question. 
and it's it's related to things that go beyond music like you know the idea of flow and uh you know how immersed you get into something and how that changes your brain function uh, and so on and i think in the the music actually offers us a really great model to look at this because as andrew and anna said before it's a quite constrained compared to some other situations plus we know that musicians often experience these high immersion uh, feelings um, and they they often report feeling them more when they're playing with other musicians and when they're playing by themselves so I think it's actually a really great model to start to look at things like like flow and maybe the way we should uh, approach it is I mean flow consists of a bunch of different aspects um, so high concentration um, a sort of loss of sense of self um, a feeling uh, that of effortlessness in that you're not controlling the, what's happening. So there's a whole bunch of different variables that seem to go into the experience of flow. And so maybe one approach that we could take is to look at some of those aspects of flow individually. And as Andrew said, maybe manipulate things and see if we can start to tease apart some of the brain correlates of some of those different aspects of, of that experience. But I would be very surprised if it's not related to, uh, you know, things that we can measure in the brain. Yeah, this is a very, uh, very interesting topic. Uh, the flow has been uh, defined, let's say, nicely in words, but uh, so far, uh, at least I don't know of, uh, of strong uh, EEG correlates in the sense of features maybe for, for flow. Are we any closer to finding those features or are they universal at all? Like you said, uh, maybe in, in some cases a higher degree of focus while uh, somewhere it just uh, it, it might be something else like uh, this immersion may, may be uh, leading to less, uh, less, less focus or at least less measured focus. Are, are we any closer to that? Anna, you're raising your hands. I actually want to ask Laurel a question based on this topic because I think it's, I was wondering to what extent do you think that um, attentional entrainment to the beat perhaps facilitates a heightened attention to, to musical stimuli or rhythmic stimuli that might facilitate in turn flow? or something like greater emergent, immersion, quote unquote, experience. And maybe people, do you think that maybe people who have more um, attentional entrainment facilitated by the beat are likelier to have more uh, experience of flow or immersion? Yeah, it's a great question. And there is, there is some work on um, uh, um, shamans and so on who use drumming and repetitive uh, rhythms to get into a state that could be, you know, a transcendental state of some kind, but that would that could be very related to flow. Um, although those states tend not to have a task in them, whereas flow tends to be a case where you're you're trying to do something, you're trying to accomplish a task. Uh, whereas purely listening to the the rhythms probably gets you into a more passive altered state of, of consciousness. But this is where I think um, it's, it's such an interesting question. And it's where I think we need to sort of tease apart the different aspects of flow and the different aspects of other altered states of consciousness, if you will, um, to look at what are the brain uh, aspects of each one of those and how do they fit together to, to give rise to these different states. But, but rhythm is definitely this uh, definitely has effects on us. I mean, we know from, you know, our work with infants that if you want to calm an infant down, one of the best ways is to sing rhythmically and move them rhyth rhythmically. So, so the, the, the idea of the beat and this predictive, repetitive patterns, they affect our autonomic responses and our emotional responses and so on. So I think, I think understanding them is important, not just for music, but you know, for understanding development and our, our general regulatory uh, processes. All right, uh, I now uh, I now have a question about these motion artifacts and I told you that I have a person to ask. 
And you mentioned this um, ASR uh, algorithm that's lately been very popular. Uh, but um, is it perfect? Uh, Professor Debener, do you think that uh, we are losing, losing something by um, artifact uh, space reconstruction? Uh, can we trust it and how do we test it? Well, yeah, nothing is perfect. <laughs> so the question is easy to answer. Um, well, uh, it's important to understand that ASR uh, it has some benefits. Uh, always compares the data relative to some calibration period. So this initial calibration period, let's say if you bring this into a music performance context, might be a resting situation where people just sit there and do nothing, don't perform or don't even listen to music. And once you then move on to the experimental task, then quite a lot of things change. For instance, the motor artifact, but also all the brain processes we might be after that process in music and contribute to maybe flow and other uh, um, aspects. So we have to be very careful on what we call uh, calibration or what kind of calibration data we need for ASR. And the second problem is of course that holds for all artifact processing in the field of EEG that we don't know the ground truth. Um, and sometimes I think um, it's more a philosophical question on how you approach data. For me, I don't believe in artifact-free data. So there may be more or less artifact visible <coughs> or detectable, but only because you don't see an artifact doesn't mean that there's no artifact contributing to your data because it's a highly complex problem. So therefore, uh, we always need to you know, be as careful as possible uh, and optimize our setup. And with regard to artifact processing, spatial information is absolutely crucial. And this also is a, is a big problem in the field of like hyperscanning, say, in natural situations, because we don't have really good EEG systems supporting us here. So what we need is self-fitting systems, like your earphones maybe, but that's not good enough. We also need a good spatial coverage and quick application systems and high quality and wireless and God knows what. So uh, all this together is, uh, is a real challenge. Um, and therefore it's nice that like manufacturers like, like Embrain train host those sessions because we can remind them on what we need uh, because it's not, uh, it's not on the market yet. So that's my view. Thank you actually, that was my last question for everyone, what do you need from us? But I think you, you answered it largely. So anyone else who has uh, anything to add is most welcome. Uh, thank you for, for this and uh, I think that we will, um, we will be seeing quite a lot of uh, ASR uh, testing in, in various studies, at least I, I expect, expect that. And, um, now, uh, I think that questions are piling up more uh, faster than, than, than I'm actually facilitating them. Um, uh, so maybe yeah, I'll, I'll just go directly to, to, to them from Louis. Uh, Anna, can you talk a bit uh, about steps to minimize the effect of motor artifacts on your amplitude envelope correlations? So still in the artifact space. So we removed stereotypical artifacts using ICA. Um, so eye movements and other artifacts. Um, and then we also inspected obviously the topographies of the amplitude envelopes um, to make sure that they reflected what is stereotypically auditory motor activity. So um, actually in, you can look at our NYAS paper to see the topographies associated with the uh, amplitude and the cortical oscillations at the frequency of the um, music performances from which we extracted the amplitude envelopes and they're very clearly auditory motor topography is very stereotypical. So I think we feel pretty confident that the results we have are not explained by motor artifact, but as has been mentioned by everyone, uh, of course, there probably were motor artifacts present and, um, you know, the, we didn't measure, you know, s synchronized body movement or anything like this and tried to decompose it from the signal. So, but that's a future direction. But yeah, we feel based on the topographies, it looks pretty clearly auditory motor. Uh, still, still with you from Anna Bianchi. Um, Question for Anna, in case of amplitude envelope correlations, is there a risk that we can get automatically higher correlations 
due to the higher individual EEG amplitudes, or would the AAC measure not be affected by that? Uh, let me read the question one second. Um, in the case, of, is it a risk that we get automatically due to higher individual EEG amplitudes? So if some people have similar baseline amplitude levels, is that what the question asker means? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not clear on, perhaps Stefan, do you understand this question better than me? I'm not sure. Well, that's, well, that's a correlation measure. Um, so it should not be strongly affected by you know, individual differences in overall amplitude and the way the spatial filters are designed that should take out most of this anyway. So I wouldn't think that's uh, an important issue here, but I understand that many people uh, don't really trust or don't focus on amplitude envelope correlations. I like it a lot, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, for a number of reasons, one being that, of course, you know, the alternative would be to look at phase-based uh, procedures uh, of connectivity. But when you look at, let's say, internal oscill oscillators in, say, easy to detect alpha frequency, uh, then, of course, my alpha oscillator uh, ticks a little bit different from, say, Anna's alpha oscillator. And even if there's only a relatively small difference in the peak frequency, then, of course, sooner or later, we will run out of phase. And I don't see this very well represented in the tools that are around. But um, of course, you know, there are different opinions, different tools. Um, there's now uh, software development going on in the field of supporting analysis for hyperscanning data. So I uh, just came across a, a very nice Python toolbox called HiPy. Uh, it's on GitHub already, and there's a preprint. And this is from Susan Bika and colleagues. And I think Susan is in the audience. Um, so this is a great uh, tools. They basically allow uh, to explore all sorts of different uh, connectivity measures in the context of hyperscanning. And that's exactly the way we have to go. So we have to basically explore which tools are most suitable, suitable for different uh, analysis questions and data sets. Thank you. Still on the topic, uh, have the panelists used uh, Rousseau's absorption in music scale to quantify these ex experiences related to flow? No? Okay. Okay, yeah, everybody's muted, so maybe they said something, but uh, we don't have. Uh, so the answer is is uh, is no. Um, Dr. Chang already mentioned the issue with artifacts in such mobile EG experiments when the musicians uh, obviously have to move in order to play. Uh, by keeping in mind that mobile EGs don't have many electrodes and there are not as many trials in these experiments. When you separate the component of motor synchrony, how many variants, uh, how much of the variants does this auditory synchrony explain? This question is for everyone. From Katarina Stekic. So I can share my uh, personal um, experience with this um, because in, for the same data, we actually recorded uh, the body movement as well. We analyzed the body movement and do like similar like leader follower relationship and then we move on to the EEG recordings. So interesting part is that in the body movement we found that the leader tend to um, predict the follower's body movement strongly than the vice versa. But the EEG recordings so far the, the preliminary findings we actually uh, after EEG data being is uh, processed we found that the lead the follower actually have a stronger predictions their brain wave have a stronger prediction to the leaders. So we were, I mean, like you mentioned that, like this question mentioned, we were uh, concerned that if we found out the brain waves also leader predict the follower, would that just be the moral artifact of the body's way? Because the body's way already showed that the leader predict the follower, right? Uh, but interesting thing that we actually show the opposite, suggesting follower predict the leader. So maybe, maybe have to, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't have any simulation result, but maybe ASR is good enough to remove that uh, level of a motor artifact. And then, so because we show the stronger trend from the follower to leader, 
which is opposite of the of their body motion. But again, that could still be contributed by other part of the body motion, which is, we didn't quantify it um, in, in the previous study. So the short answer is we don't know, but uh, maybe not that serious. That's my answer. Just one note about, so, so Sylvie Nazarajan has done uh, auditory motor synchronization studies where she dissociated the um, auditory. So she had a simple just tap, tap alone without any external stimulus, tap with a stimulus and then tap with an auditory stimulus. Um, and she had various, and she, she basically, I think, and then she, I think showed that, um, and then she did some sort of source localization analysis and she, her work actually shows um, I think it was the the auditory signal predicted synchronization with the external rhythm. I can't remember. I need to double check that. But her work definitely addresses this question. Perhaps again, it's not a hyperscanning scenario, but it is um, a sensory motor synchronization scenario. I think that's the only stuff that I know of, at least with inter related to sensory motor synchronization in an auditory context that tries to dissociate those two things. Perhaps you know other things. Yeah. So uh, while others are, are thinking, maybe just ask a bit of a controversial EG question. Uh, we often hear about uh, the, we were now in, um, in the correlations of uh, interbrain and intrabrain correlations related to music performance. But uh, uh, we know that uh, a lot of people are investigating uh, music in relation to emotions and uh, uh, and the mood. So I want to start with EEG related question. Uh, how much do you believe, uh, how, how robust are uh, EEG derived uh, emotion features? Professor Trainer, maybe start with you. Um. I guess I'm pretty agnostic on this. I haven't done much on um, EEG-related emotion uh, features. Um, I don't see why they shouldn't come out. Um, but of course, the, the emotion system is complex and has a lot of different brain areas. And separating all of those areas may be challenging with EEG. Um, perhaps some some type of combination of EEG or using MEG uh, with with MRI might might help us to start to disentangle that more. But I I should say I'm not an expert in this at all. So probably some of the other panelists can can better answer this question. Mr. Davinash, what do you think? Can we trust uh, uh, EEG derived emotions? Well, I haven't done any, any work in this field, um, but I, I like exploring new ways of approaching the data. And uh, uh, one um, strategy in our couple of labs I've used successfully, like a lot, is intersubject correlations. So to the extent that you bring people into a similar emotional state, uh, say in a hyperscanning uh, uh, scenario, then one should also see similarities in the EEG that go beyond sensory processing. At least for like, uh, say, attentional listening, for instance, uh, of um, running speech, uh, um, this approach produces really nice data and gives us some, some idea about how similar um, EEG signals are without averaging over tons of trials. So basically, you give up on trial averaging and instead take a natural series, time series, um, which would also be like feasible, I think, in, in music performance. So uh, maybe this approach could also be applied to emotional research, but I haven't done anything of this. That is uh, that uh, gives actually a nice introduction to my to my next question because uh, oh, on one hand we have uh, let's say established features uh, that, that they can be. Um, indexes for uh, or so all sorts of things uh, there can be uh, uh, definitions of some uh, emotions uh, uh, extracted from from the eg but uh, uh, 
uh, do you think uh, there is uh, there is a way to advance there, uh, especially in uh, in uh, uh, in correlations related to music, are uh, do, do we need better tools, or or are we um, or are we satisfied with uh, with what we have, and just should ensure that there are no motion artifacts and we record in realistic settings? Questions for everyone. Is phase locking index or stuff is is it good enough for? Or do you expect uh, machine learning uh, and uh, AI techniques maybe to to give us something there? Is the question about emotion or about sense uh, or, or, or sensory process, like what kinds of components? Uh... Uh, the question is more related to, to the tools. So we have, a, a, let's say, a set of tools that, that we have at our disposal now. You know, we have a way to calculate valence and see uh, someone is feeling this or that. Uh, we have uh, uh, phase locking and uh, uh, all kinds of correlations. Are these tools per se good enough or should we invest uh, time to seek better tools that, that would be more useful in music studies? Um. I, I, I personally, I don't have much experience on these, but I feel that definitely we need to explore many other tools. Like, like the uh, the challenge in my data is that uh, I only have a limited number of trials and limited number of sample uh, of channels and limited kind of recordings. But there are so many things happening when we perform music together, and uh, every trials are 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 very unique. Even though they play the same conditions, same music, but every time they play, it is slightly different. So we couldn't average across the trials. We couldn't do traditional ERP analysis. We couldn't do traditional way. We we enlarge the signal to noise ratio. So definitely, I I feel that definitely we need uh, maybe machine learning could be the way to investigate it, the the scattered um, features around the time point and channels to extract those, uh, which is just cannot be easily extracted with just average, you know, selecting one or two uh, channels. And maybe um, and a long time recording, but probably we can record maybe a musical band and every week they, they rehearse the same piece and then do a machine learning, something like that. Um, probably that can, we can learn a lot from this kind of data. All right, uh, so uh, another question from the audience. Uh, can you speak to the use of music in large group events such as protests and rallies? Uh, to what extent does music or rhythmic chanting and drumming facilitate that loss of sense of self and the formation of the crowd as one social agent? And uh, would you expect to see in trained brain dynamics and uh, physiological responses in such large crowd activity? Uh, add on to that question is how to facilitate how to facilitate that, uh, how to become leader of protest. Anyone with the idea is welcome to, to comment. Question is from Shannon Prosh. Well, maybe I'll wait in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think that those things definitely happen in crowd. Um, and music and chanting facilitates it. Uh, and so from our studies that are just done on <clears throat> two people interacting, we can probably extrapolate to these effects uh, with crowds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in the live lab, we have conducted a couple of studies. Um, so not using EEG so much. Uh, yet, at least we haven't analyzed it, uh, but looking at uh, motion capture of whole audiences when they're listening to performances. Uh, so for example, when people, uh, because of the, the, the sound system and acoustics that we have in there, we can recreate uh, pretty exactly a live performance that we've recorded. So we've conducted a couple of studies where we've had um, one audience experienced the live performance and another audience experienced 
pretty much something similar with a big video screen and the, and the same sound, um, but not live. And you get differences in those conditions. So people move more when it's a live group than when it's not a live group. Uh, you also get differences by people's tastes. So if people are sort of fans of the, the group playing, uh, they, they move more. And you also get interactions between, which is a paper that we're submitting now, looking at interactions between audience members and how they're moving. And so again, we start to find correlations between how people move and their, their feelings about the, the music and, and these kinds of things. So it's very, it's very preliminary, um, but I think there are many labs around the world that are interested in these questions. And I suspect over the next little while, we're going to see quite a lot more activity on, on these larger group, uh, these larger group dynamics. Um, so I might also add just that there's sort of two levels at which you can study this. So, so one is on the, the sort of group level feelings of loss of sense of self and coordination of um, actions and emotions and so on. Um, but another level um, that actually relates to a lot of animal work, it has to do with uh, self-organization of a system. So when people aren't instructed, um, they'll often just spontaneously start to coordinate. And one of the examples given is when people clap at the end of a concert, they may start clapping in a rhythm together. Um, so in, in my lab, we've started looking at uh, drumming circles where people basically aren't given an instruction they just have to start drumming together and so how they they do start drumming in synchrony with each other so there's a there's a lot of questions about the dynamics of, of how that works and looking at, at mathematical models to um, you know to figure this out um, and so one of the interesting things that we found is that um, when people drum by themselves, they're actually more accurate individually than when they drum in the group. But if you look at the average of the group, the group is more accurate than any individual. So in the group, every we think every individual is kind of adjusting to everybody else. So their own accuracy actually becomes less. But the average of the group becomes greater. So you can kind of relate that potentially to benefits of of group activity that maybe you lose a little precision or something yourself, but there's a benefit to the overall group. Um, and for people who are interested, again, I'm not an expert in the animal literature at all, but there are um, people who study uh, group behaviors and group dynamics and animal models, and they're way ahead of us, I think, in the human realm. Um, and they postulate that these behaviors have emerged because the group as a whole gets benefit um, that each individual may may not experience themselves, but the group as a whole benefits. Well, that's excellent uh, because we also have a question from Krista Fairchild. What is the benefit? Exactly that question, like importance of correlated EEG during uh, during music. So you say that um, basically group as a whole uh, benefits from it, even if we are not uh, uh, there on the individual level. Is that uh, the right thing to say or? Yeah, yeah, on one level you could say that. Uh, on another level, you know, the EEG may correlate, but I think there's a deep question about what does that mean? Like, do, I don't think any of us think it's like, you know, telepathy that the brains are getting together. They're, they're, they're correlating because they're doing similar things and they're responding in similar ways. And those social interactions um, are crucial. We're an extremely social species. We can't survive without other people. So I think these, these brain entrainments that we see when people are coordinating their actions are, are, are a reflection of these really important social processes that we need to interact in complex ways with other people, really in order to survive as a species. That's an excellent answer and a very intriguing one. So. Back to the 
couple of questions from the audience from uh, for Andrew's study. Uh, Milan Voller asks, uh, during the study, uh, were EEGs of listeners, non-musicians, recorded and compared, correlated to EEGs of performers? Uh, sadly, no. We only have the musicians' EEG recorded. Next time. Next time. Do you think that this is a thing to pursue? What? Yeah, actually, that would be cool because um, uh, if we want to understand the information flow, this should be mostly, well, well when I'm seeking, I have a different idea. So, so because the list audience just maybe should largely listen to the, the musicians, but maybe, I mean, uh, lots of cases which just come into my mind right in the, this very second that lots of live musicians sometimes will observe the audience responses and make adjustments. So maybe that's part of the secret of doing a live performances and understanding how the music, how the audience brain associated with the musician's brain. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, last question for you, I promise. In one of your slides, the pro plot corresponding to delay in onsets between the two musicians showed a similar trend. Is this a usual thing from uh, Mirai Sharma? Yeah, I, I want to confirm that uh, maybe the audience, if the audience uh, referred to Z's plot on the right top corner, uh, it, it was actually not the EG plot, it was the body sway pl plot. I'm just using that as a demonstration of, um, of, of how we can use one time series to predict another time series, which is a concept of granger causality and partial directing coherence. So it, it's not EEG data. Uh, all right, um, I, I have a question. Uh, I'll be a bit selfish towards the audience, but uh, in, uh, in, in music related studies, if I'm not wrong, uh, and hyperscanning in general, uh, uh, the first publications were from fMRI, and uh, then we moved to EEG, and for obvious reasons. But did we lose? Did we lose something uh, by it? What do professors think? Uh, that maybe relates to another question that just came in on on other modalities, uh, and I believe that when it comes to hyperscanning, e and this is really something for EEG. We need to have the temporal dynamics out of question. And at the same time, we need to have spatial information. So uh, FNIRS, in my view, is not really a good alternative here. And another reason is that we want to do our recordings in natural situations. So um, quick to apply systems to a group of individuals <laughs> is what we need and, and synchronization and so on. Uh, I don't see this coming for FNIRS or any other modality. So that will be a field for EEG for the next, I don't know, 10 years or so. But it's my, I'm biased, of course. Uh, all right, last question. Uh, any thoughts on using AI for generative music based on neurofeedback? Oh. Um, I have a few thoughts, but they're not directly related. Um, one is, um, so we, we recently um, started looking into sonification as a tool of, of neurofeedback. So you basically translate a feature of your EEG to sound. And um, we also tried this in, in a very limited setup in, in a hyperscanning uh, scenario but it's super complicated. And one reason is of course that people need to learn to control their own brain activity and they need to be convinced that they can do it. And that of course depends on how you give feedback and you know how do you deal with artifacts and so on. Um, yeah, neural feedback on its own, it's a rather complicated issue because uh, with a few exceptions, it takes quite a while and many sessions to learn to control some features of your brain activity uh, seriously. Uh, and that somehow limits application, of course. So can you drive, can you drive our generative music? You know, this is, uh, uh, we need to do our homework here. Yeah. Do you believe in driving the brain states using music? Um, yeah, that might be a tool, yeah. Yeah, why not? 
All right. Um, um, I'm going to share my screen for uh, probably last time. Uh, this is a um, uh, this is a way to keep in touch with uh, with the community. We are trying to to put put people together uh, on a on a Discord for mainly hyperscanning uh, related studies. So do feel to free to you know uh, join. Uh, we'll share the the info later. Uh, if you want to talk directly with us and you think we can we can help you in your studies, uh, just a few words about what we do. Uh, we believe in this very personalized thing because uh, people need uh, different different stuff and it, uh, the key is in understanding uh, your research goals. And uh, this is a first uh, circle from our free circle approach, as we call it. So the second is to identify challenges of what is really the problem and the obstacle. And only then, uh, if we have something to recommend, then, uh, then we come up and do that. So feel free to to uh, reach and uh, and uh, uh, and we can we can talk uh, with this idea. I would uh, with this notion actually. I would like to uh, thank all, uh, all our wonderful participants again for being there, for doing great scientific work, for answering these very challenging questions. And we are certainly going to keep an eye uh, on you and uh, look forward to your to your future work and uh, and uh, just keep up the good stuff coming and we hope to know more about music and uh, uh, an interbrain uh, synchrony and the reasons be behind uh, our desire and our liking the music so much. Mm -hmm.